Hi, this is Peter Wooding and welcome to this week's Christian Weekly News. As we continue to highlight the importance of engaging in public life. In this week's program, we hear from a number of campaigners seeking to be a voice for the voiceless. Dr. Patrick Sukdeo, International Director of the Barnabas Fund, highlights the plight of persecuted Christians in Syria. We hear from a number of pro-life campaigners seeking to be a voice for the unborn child at the recent Clarkson Academy. And Andrea Williams gives us an update on the work of Christian Concern and the Christian Legal Centre. A number of pro-life campaigners recently gathered for the Clarkson Academy at the Emmanuel Christian Centre in London to look at ways they can continue to be a voice for the unborn child. We went along and caught up with some of the key speakers and also captured highlights of one of the Abort 67 displays. Hi, we're, we're at the Clarkson Academy and we're just about to go out in the rain uh, to help people understand the, the humanity of the unborn child early on in pregnancy and the inhumanity of, of, of abortion and we're, we're doing that outside the Department of Health, uh, outside Downing Street to let those responsible uh, for, for these decisions see the reality of, of those decisions, to help passers by the general public see the reality of abortion. And when we've done this before, we've seen many people change their minds about abortion and about the value of the unborn child and seen women who were considering having an abortion uh, change their mind and decide to keep their baby. So that's why we're going out today to get very wet. You can come with us. Come with us. <laughs> I'm Scott Klusendorf. I'm president of Life Training Institute, and we train pro-lifers to make a case for the pro-life view in the public square using facts and arguments that resonate with people who may even have a secularized worldview and who haven't considered carefully enough the claims we're making. What we're trying to do here in London is give pro-lifers a good dose of confidence. We want them to leave the Clarkson Academy knowing that their case is sound, that they can deliver their case with confidence, and know that it can stand up in the court of public opinion. Here in a one-minute summary is the argument we're teaching them to make. Elective abortion is wrong, because it takes the life of an innocent human being. And we defend that using science, and we defend it using philosophy. We defend it with science by pointing out that the unborn are distinct, living, and whole human beings. And we defend it with philosophy by pointing out that there's no essential difference between the embryo you once were and the adult you are today that would justify killing you at that earlier stage of development. Christian pro-lifers must know how to articulate that intellectual case or we're not going to uh, succeed in the marketplace of ideas. Two things I would say to pro-life Christians in the United Kingdom. Number one, your nation will continue to tolerate abortion as long as it never has to see abortion. That point will be taught here at the Clarkson Academy. But secondly, the United Kingdom will continue to tolerate abortion as long as pro-lifers fail to make a persuasive case that not only explains what they believe, but why they believe it. So we are going to impact this culture at the visceral level using images, and at the intellectual level using facts and arguments that can't be easily dismissed as being some kind of subjective opinion. Well, first of all, have the intellectual courage to look at all of the relevant information, and don't shy away from it because you find it personally distasteful. The heart of the quest for truth means we look at all the evidence. And we don't shadow that which we don't like. If we are afraid to look at truth, even inconvenient truth, we will be people who live in the dark. And Christians are not called to live in the dark. They're called to expose evil and live in the light. Secondly, what I would say to pro-life Christians, you can't just stop at exposing evil. You've got to equip fellow Christians to make a case for the pro-life view where they live and work and go to school. And we'll be focusing on those points this weekend. I would say as a final word, this nation, the United Kingdom, for centuries was at the hub of sending out the Christian gospel. The United Kingdom, more than any other nation, sent forth missionaries to convey biblical truth. 
That can happen again in this country, especially on the pro-life issue, where this nation has a chance to set a great example to other world nations about how to treat the weakest and most vulnerable amongst us. This debate is about do all human beings have an equal right to life or do only some have it because of some characteristic that may come and go in their lifetime. We're people of human equality. We are teaching a message that all humans have value because of the kind of thing they are. The citizens of the United Kingdom need to convey that message, especially the Christian people. Hi, we're here at the display of Abort 67. We're just displaying some images of aborted fetuses, aborted babies, and we're just trying to get gauge the public opinion as to what they think when they see these images. cells up to about three months but I don't realize that this is the actual baby and that is it that will just continue growing in a, an incredible way and then will be a tiny human being My name is Greg Cunningham, I'm from America, and I direct the Center for Bioethical Reform, and we are an anti-abortion strategic planning organization. We're involved in consulting with pro-life groups uh, around the country and around the world, helping them develop strategy and tactics for anti-abortion activism. We have uh, offices here in the UK. Uh, the Center for Bioethical Reform's acronym is CBR, and we have a CBR UK office uh, down in uh, Worthing, down near Brighton in southern England. And we work with Christian Concern, Andrea Williams and her legal group, uh, uh, Barrister Paul Diamond, I think is actually a solicitor, and solicitor um, Michael Phillips, uh, I have a legal background myself in the United States. Uh, Andrea Williams of Christian Concern is also a lawyer. Uh, so at a, at a leadership level, m many of our directors are uh, attorneys because a lot of what we do requires either the threatening of lawsuits or the filing of lawsuits to force the government to permit us to educate the public regarding the horror of abortion. We, we've done a study of the history of social reform, and I'm here today to talk uh, to, to the Clarkson Academy. Uh, Andrew Stevenson is our UK director here and, and heads up the Clarkson Academy. If you look at the history of social reform, it, it is invariably, whether in the United States or England or Canada or Australia, New Zealand, wherever, um, it's, it's the history of graphic imagery. It's disturbing pictures that are, are designed to educate the public as to the humanity of victims of injustice and the inhumanity of the injustice itself. Because very often uh, victims of injustice are marginalized or trivialized by oppressors as being subhuman. And as soon as you establish in the popular mind the idea that Jews, for instance, are subhuman, of course, only human beings can be persons. And if you're not a human, you have no entitlement to rights of personhood because you're not a person. And so then the Holocaust happens. And if black people are subhuman, then slavery happens. And all these terrible, terrible atrocities that have occurred around the world are always preceded by a propaganda campaign that's designed to dehumanize the victims. And so visual imagery is a very powerful way of pushing back against the lies that Jews aren't human, that black people aren't human, 
Uh, I'm Scots-Irish in America. The Irish were denounced as being subhuman. They were equated with animals. They couldn't get jobs in many parts of America. So th this is a common problem. And it really has nothing to do with race or ethnicity or color. It, it happens in almost every culture. The patterns are the same. The ignorance is the same. The evil's the same. And, and effective tactics are the same. Pictures settle in the minds of People of conscience, anybody with a functioning conscience who sees a picture of a black person being whipped, picking cotton, or, uh, or a Jew's body in a death camp, is going to look at that picture and they're going to be horrified by it and they're going to say, that offends my sense of justice. Even if they're not Christian, they're going to look at that and say, that's not right, that's, um, no society can long endure if it tolerates those kinds of terrible injustices. So uh, the conventional wisdom is in the pro-life movement today is that if we upset or offend anybody, we're going to lose. When the reality is that effective reformers always upset and offend people, and the most effective reformers are never liked, and the most liked reformers are never effective. Martin Luther King was assassinated. He was, ex he was a pioneer in the use of really disturbing imagery to shock the conscience of the culture. William Wilberforce, right here in England, in Parliament for 30 years, uh, tried to abolish the slave trade and failed until he started using pictures that humanized black people and, and made real to the English people the privations of slavery. Slavery wasn't just tea and coffee and sugar and molasses and rum. It was human beings being tortured to death to produce those goods. And once the Brits began to see those pictures, the lump of sugar that they were dropping in their tea in the morning didn't taste so good to them. And that was the point. That was the idea. Everybody got angry at Wilberforce, so much so that he required armed bodyguards to follow him around because the slave traders weren't afraid of words. They were afraid of pictures. They were trying to stop the pictures. So we're here today to talk about the pictures, the importance of using the pictures, the importance of recognizing that when you confront the culture with visual evidence of society's involvement in injustice, people's guilt, um, they're going to get angry and, and they will slay the messenger. The tendency is to take out their anger on the person making them look at the picture. We have to be willing to endure that, to accept that persecution. That's the Christ-like way. That's what Christ followers do when they are prophetic. And we're trying to be not merely pastoral, as Christ was pastoral, but prophetic as Christ was prophetic. If, if the question is, what would I say to my brothers and sisters in the United Kingdom? And, and I feel a particular kinship to, to, to the UK because, because I am English as an American. Almost everything I am is English. My mother's family came from England. My father's family is Scots-Irish. So, I mean, we are, my, my, my family is very, very British, but, but, but beyond that, um, we, we care in America about England because all of our institutions are fundamentally English institutions. Almost everything that's great about America is fundamentally English. And, and, I'm, and I also care deeply about the church in England because I'm a Christian, I'm a Christ follower, um, and, and there's one body of Christ, and we are obligated to work together